HMAS Sydney was part of a three-ship subclass of the Leander-class light cruiser. The Leanders will in time get their own video, so general technical details and historical background here will be somewhat light to avoid duplication. The subclass comprised the last three ships, with the primary difference being the separation of machinery spaces to increase survivability, since it would then be impossible to completely disable the ship with a single hit to the engines. This also saved weight, but this was countered by the need to extend the armour belt to cover the wider engine spaces. An additional idea to make the lower turrets triples instead of twins was dropped, so the most obvious external sign of the changes was the subclass having two funnels instead of one. With 72,000 shaft horsepower powering four screws, the ships could make just over 32 knots, with a standard displacement of just over 7,000 tonnes. The ship's armament consisted of four twin turrets equipped with six-inch guns in super-firing pairs fore and aft, with an anti-aircraft and close-range defensive suite of four single four-inch guns, three quad 50 caliber Vickers machine guns, and 16 single 303-inch machine guns. 14 Lewis and two Vickers in that last lot. These could be moved around the ship as needed, although a single Vickers gun and five of the Lewis guns would be removed in the late 1930s, along with four three-pound saluting guns. A pair of quadruple torpedo launchers, one per side, were also fitted, along with a catapult and a supermarine walrus aircraft. The primary sensor, beyond the gun directors and the good old Mark I human eyeball, was a retractable sonar dome underneath the bow of the ship. Originally laid down in July 1933 as HMS Phaeton, she was bought while still under construction and renamed HMAS Sydney by the Australian government on the grounds that the ship was almost finished and could be in service quickly, whilst the home-built HMAS Adelaide had taken seven years to complete. Sydney was launched in September 1934 and commissioned a year later. Total completion time, a relatively sprightly two years and two months. Protection was a baseline 1 inch belt with 3 inches of armour over the machinery spaces and 2 inches over the magazines. Sydney headed for its new home in late 1935, but diverted to join the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean in sanctioning Italy over its actions in Abyssinia, later joined by the heavy cruiser HMAS Australia. She would finally arrive in her name city in August 1935, joining in fleet cruises and training exercises focused on protecting trade to and from Australia. With the outbreak of World War II, the Sydney's first action would be a hunt for the Graf Spee when that ship was operating in the Indian Ocean, hunting alongside the Canberra, which would have made for an interesting match-up had the two Australian ships found the German. But with the German raider remaining elusive, she received maintenance and then joined the Indian Ocean escort duty guarding several convoys of Anzac troops heading for the North African theatre alongside Royal Navy units. By June 1940, the Australian destroy destroyer squadron operating in the Mediterranean had impressed the Royal Navy so much that Admiral Cunningham requested that Sydney be attached to his 7th cruiser squadron on the grounds that he could expect more excellent performance from other Royal Australian Navy ships. Sydney arrived just in time for the Italians to declare war, and promptly set about making them regret that, shooting up a military camp near the Italian port of Bardia, losing her walrus to an unintended friendly fire incident, although the damaged aircraft fortunately, along with its pilot, made it to a land base safely. The French surrender led to some tensions, with the ships training guns on French ships, including old battleships, in Alexandria Harbour. But unlike Mers el Kabir, both sides were reasonable, and the ships were peacefully disarmed, instead of heading back to Vichy France, which was the order of the Vichy government. Escorting a Malta-bound convoy, the protective escort th saw off three Italian destroyers, crippling one, the Espero, which made the rather stupid mistake of opening fire on the Sydney as it closed on the crippled ship to take off survivors. Sydney promptly opened fire and sank it, the destroyer shots having missed. She then rescued some survivors and left one of the ship's boats with supplies for any they hadn't managed to get to in time. A powerful battle force sailed in July to escort more convoys, but a British submarine reported the Italian fleet was at sea, 
and this was supported by the sudden appearance of massed Italian air raids, which Sydney helped to defend the fleet against. Although at one point she joined in a vicious barrage against a high-altitude spotter aircraft that actually turned out to be the planet Venus. Having failed to become the first warship to shoot down another planet, the fleet would then engage the Italian cruiser screen the next afternoon, with Sydney not scoring any hits on its opposite numbers, but managing to damage an Italian destroyer. The end of the Battle of Calabria would see the ship undamaged, but with nothing but harsh Australian cursing for its anti-aircraft defence, having expended every single round of ammunition on the ship apart from some of its six-inch shells. After resupply, the ship departed with HMS Havoc to hunt for Axis shipping and support an anti-submarine destroyer sweep. Concluding that doing both was actually impossible, the Sydney's captain moved the ship closer to the destroyers in support of the second part of the mission, which was just as well as a pair of Italian light cruisers showed up to attack them. The Italians were surprised by the prompt arrival of the cruiser, and within a few minutes the Banda Neri was hit and turned to hide behind a smokescreen. Sydney then shifted fire to the Bartolomeo Colleoni and disabled her in short order the Italian ships having sacrificed protection for speed and paying the price as a result. For the Colleoni, this was a fatal decision as she was torpedoed and sunk after Sydney knocked out her engines. For the Neri, the decision was not quite as lethal as she was able to use her superior speed to outrun her attackers. This time, Sydney had expended almost all of her six-inch ammunition, and the victorious flotilla headed back to port, dodging vengeful air attacks as they went. Restocking on ammo yet again, she would help sink the tanker Ermione before getting a new coat of camo paint along with a refit, and she was back doing bombardment missions and convoy escort before too long. This included disguising herself as a condottieri class Italian cruiser to sneak close to an Italian airbase and shell it, whilst her escort vended off numerous Italian small torpedo boats but she forgot to cut down the disguise and was almost shot up by her own side on her return to port. This mission, for some reason, resulted in the ship being dubbed a Stormy Petrel by Admiral Cunningham, which became a nickname for the ship. More patrols and a relatively uneventful spell was broken by supporting the Taranto air attack with a diversionary raid finding an enemy convoy on the way back and helping sink three merchant ships as well as damaging a destroyer, whilst avoiding return fire and a torpedo. By January 1941, after more escorting and bombardment missions, the ship needed a major refit to repair wear and tear, so she swapped places with HMAS Perth and headed home for this purpose, with the idea being to help hunt down German merchant raiders near Australia afterwards. Some of the crew were sent to England to help man new N-class destroyers that the Royal Australian Navy was in the process of receiving, and she arrived home in early February after a brief detour looking for the armed merchant cruiser Atlantis. She'd managed to fight her way through the early Mediterranean campaign with only a single death, and that was due to illness rather than enemy action. Most of the rest of 1941 passed quietly, with various convoy escort duties and the occasional search, and not amounting to all that much. The 19th of November would find the ship cruising off the western Australian coast, when she spotted a merchant ship that promptly turned away. Curious, she sped up to intercept, closing in from the stern and ordering the ship to identify itself. After a number, a number of somewhat suspicious delays, the ship claimed it was the Dutch vessel Strat Malaka under pursuit from a merchant raider. Growing more concerned and somewhat curious, the Sydney pulled up alongside just under a mile away and demanded the ship's secret ID code, which the ship didn't have, since it was in fact the German raider Cormoran in disguise. The Raider was armed with six 5.9-inch guns, two 37mm and five 20mm cannon, as well as six torpedo tubes, and was actually of a similar size to the cruiser, although its displacement was more. Recognising that their cover was about to be blown, the Cormoran dropped the disguise around its guns, hoisted the Greek's marine ensign and opened fire, with Sydney returning fire pretty much at the same time. Unfortunately, the first salvo from Sydney was high, inflicting minimal damage, 
whilst the Cormoran's fire, having obviously it been a bit more prepared, was more accurate. The first few salvos knocking out Sydney's bridge, forward turrets, aircraft, and scoring a number of hits near the waterline. At the practically point-blank ranges the engagement was going on at, the Sydney's light armour was not of any real assistance, and the smaller calibre weapons of the Cormoran were in range to hose down the Sydney's upper decks, preventing it from bringing the 4-inch guns or other smaller weapons into the fight. Cormoran at this point would also launch two torpedoes. Sydney's rear turrets would then come into action, the lower turret being relatively inaccurate, but the upper or X turret scored multiple hits on Cormoran, starting fires and wounding crew. At this point, one of the torpedoes that had been launched hit Sydney below the forward turret and set the ship into a hard turn towards the radar, her forward turrets taking further hits and the rear turrets now stuck uselessly pointing the wrong way. Two torpedoes from the unmasked starboard launcher were f- that had then fired, but Cormoran, angling to destroy the cruiser, unintentionally evaded them. Despite this accidental evasion, the hits scored by Sydney's X turret had been mortal blows, and the raider was well on its way to the bottom as her engines failed, although the guns themselves kept firing. After 30 minutes, the ships were just over 6 miles apart and both on fire, so they stopped shooting at each other, with the two vessels drifting further apart as the currents took them. It appears that Sydney likely remained afloat for about four hours before damage from the torpedo hit and the effects of the sea caused the bow to tear off, with the ship sinking stern first shortly thereafter with all hands. On Cormoran, the fires burned out of control until just after midnight when they reached the mines it carried and the ship exploded. 82 of her crew would be lost, with just over 300 survivors eventually being captured. At first, the fact that Sydney was overdue was not a cause of concern, and it would be five days before the search was begun, with information drifting in as various boats and rafts from Cormoran were picked up by passing ships, and then the ships and aircraft involved in the search found even more. As far as the Sydney was concerned, only two Carly floats and a life belt were ever recovered. Multiple searches after the war would be conducted to try and find the wreck to little avail, and many competing theories about the ship's final hours would therefore arise, including some truly absurd conspiracy theories in the 1980s involving literal false flags, Japanese submarines, and the British somehow finding out about the planned attack on Pearl Harbour, but then not telling anyone. The fact that a possible victim of the sinking had washed up on an island and the account of the discovery of his body and the Carly float he came in on was only published later on didn't help matters. Eventually, in 2007, the wreck of Cormoran was located and then, extrapolating from accounts of the battle, the Sydney's likely location was determined and her wreck was also found. Most of the controversy seems to be around people being unable to accept that a cruiser was sunk by a merchant ship. But as we've seen, Cormoran had the advantage of surprise and was actually almost as heavily armed and the Sydney had lost its two primary advantages, what armour it had, and its accuracy at long-range fire, due to closing with the Cormoran, to a point where the 5.9-inch guns could ignore art, the armour that the Sydney possessed, and the Cormoran's lack of centralised fire control didn't really matter. As to why the ship closed to such a close range... Speculation's always going to remain, but it seems likely that the Sydney's captain, who had just been assigned from a shore posting, simply wasn't suspicious as it would eventually turn out he needed to be. The Sydney was a very unusual case of a warship being lost with all hands, even something like HMS Hood left a few survivors, and the only reason the Sydney isn't as well known for its loss today as you might think it otherwise should be is because the events of Pearl Harbour rather overtook it, as these occur short, occurred shortly after the loss of the Sydney, and obviously do- began to dominate the media headlines for a considerable time afterwards. Once the Australian and British authorities were happy that they had a reasonable picture of what had gone on in the battle, 
from the Cormoran survivors, further orders were issued that forbade Australian ships from closing in to the kind of distances that Sydney had when they were approaching suspicious ships. And possibly as a result of this, no further Australian or British warships were lost to this kind of surprise attack. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to tag your question with Q&A if you want to leave a question for the dry dock.